Religion is the opium of the masses, an age-long saying of Karl Marx that has been proved right over and over again, especially in developing countries like Nigeria. More often than not, religious sentiments have determined where an individual, group or even geopolitical region in the country would place its support. When Bishop Matthew Hassan Kuka made his Christmas Day broadcast accusing the Buhari administration of nepotic tendencies, the likes that had never been seen before in this country, he could not have envisaged the backlash his comments would cause. A particular statement that has raised the ire of some groups and the presidency is that if a southern president had tried half of what President Muhammad Buhari had done, a coup might be in the offing. It elicited a prompt response from the presidency, who accused the Catholic bishop of calling for a violent overthrow of a democratically elected government and insisting it was not what a religious leader should engage in. Christian and Islamic organizations have lined up in attack and in defense of Bishop Kuka's stand, and he himself have come out to deny calling for a violent overthrow. But can Bishop Kuka's message be taken out of the context of religion and studied on face value? Why has Nigerian politics become increasingly intermingled with religion? Can a leader aspire without his religious roots being taken into context? This is Politics on Sunday. I am Femi Akonde. Nigeria is about the only country in the world with its population equally split between Christians and Muslims. Yet by its constitution, it remains a secular state with its citizens guaranteed the freedom to practice any religion of their choice. There are those who believe that religion in governance had always been a contentious issue brought to the fore when the former governor of Zamfara State extended the application of Sharia to criminal law in 1999. Before then, it had only applied to civil matters like divorce and inheritance. Eleven other states in the north swiftly followed Zamfara's example and Sharia law was here to stay. But there are those who link the introduction of Sharia to the rise of uh, radical non-state actors who have waged an insurgency on the country for over 11 years. It has also raised not so radical groups, both Christian and Muslim, who continue to question state policy and the effects it has particularly on their denominations. Under President Muhammad Buhari, this has become too acrimonic the face-off between the presidency and Bishop Kuka being one of the many incidents when the style of this administration have been reduced to bickerings among religious groups. It raises questions. Can a Nigerian aspire now to any position without his affiliation to either of the two Abrahamic religions becoming a bone of contention? I sat with Senator Ahmed Yerima, a former governor of Zamfara State, credited with being the first governor to introduce Sharia law to Nigeria's landscape and who incidentally has ambitions to also become Nigeria's president. Our conversation this week is with the former governor of Zanfara State, Senator Sani Ahmed Yerima. Welcome to the program, sir. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Uh, you came into politics a long time ago, but you became the governor of Zamfara State in 1999. At that time, at a very young age, so I must say, uh, uh, more than 20 years ago, when you look at Nigeria's uh, democratic journey from that time till now, would you say the country has fared well as a democratic nation? Uh, yes, I think uh, so far so good. You see, every country of the world, including the United, United States of America, has been facing a lot of challenges over time. Um, what's happening to us in Nigeria today should not be something that will tell us uh, something. I mean, the democracy has not fared well. I believe that uh, every country will have to go uh, through phases of development. And I'm sure we are in another phase. And by the grace of God, we'll go over it. Yeah, but you know, uh, it came with 
um, a lot of issues. It was like a learning curve for even our Democrats, you know, um, shedding off um, the weight of the military regime that had been at the hems of affairs for a long time. The political players, how well did they perform? Because a lot of people now say that the major problem with Nigeria is leadership. Definitely it's leadership. You see, um, by the time you continue to elect people, that's why democracy is uh, defined as government of the people, for the people, by the people. It is expected that uh, over time, people will learn to elect people based on principles and ideology, not based on how much they give them, or how much they have, or how much they possess. Uh, like I said, we have been in a struggle, we have been in learning curve, and, uh, but I think people are getting uh, more and more aware. We are a diverse nation. We are got a nation of different ethnicity, at least two major religions, um, Islam and Christianity. But uh, we have so many tribes, small, small tribes. And so this feeling of uh, marginalization, um, some people thinking that they are not happy with the way things are going, uh, is because of, as I said, leadership. But we will continue to try, and uh, by the time we have uh, people more educated and people more conversant with democracy and uh, the norms and values of democracy are practiced, I'm sure things will be better. Okay, your state, Zamfara, is um, one state in the Northwest that presently has, is grappling with serious security challenges. When you were governor, it was a very peaceful state, but a lot changed. What went wrong? How did it get to this point where it's now the hotbed of, um, ba for banditry and some other violent crimes? It's still part of the system problem, system failure. Poverty is now the major problem facing Nigeria. And uh, COVID-19 has also made it worse. Uh, the country is grappling with uh, lack of resources. You look at uh, our history, during uh, the regime of General Yakubu Gawan, uh, the government was even saying that their problem is not money, it's how to spend it. And uh, during our time, it was better, President uh, Obasanjo made effort to exit Nigeria from uh, debt. He did a lot of uh, effort, and by the time he left, our debt level, debt stock, especially external debt, was virtually zero. But uh, during President Jonathan, this thing came up again, and we started uh, in going into debt. Even though at that time, crude oil price was about $140 per barrel. And, uh, but unfortunately, when uh, President Buhari started, he came with very good intention. Everybody in Nigeria, up to this moment, believes that Buhari is an uncorruptible leader. Unfortunately, the resources of the government came down. Crude oil price came as low as uh, 30, below $30 per barrel. But all the same, we have been struggling, and by the grace of God, you can see what is happening today. So major problem that is facing our people in Zafar and all over the other parts of the north is poverty. I'm sure there has to be concerted effort to fight poverty and illiteracy in order to get out of this mess. But some people say this poverty has been used as a tool by the ruling class to control uh, the population. Do you agree with that? And how can we break um, that chain of control that the ruling class have over um, that the population using that poverty as a tool? Well, we have to elect leaders that fear God. Everything in this world has to go back to God. You have to take everything back to God. Uh, as good Muslims and good Christians in Nigeria, we always talk about God when we have problems. And uh, I want to tell you that by the time you go outside this country, you see that Christians in Nigeria are more Christian than any other Christian in the world. You go to Western world now, they are fighting Christianity and Islam. They just want uh, human beings to be totally free, ab absolutely free of God. That's why they want uh, uh, this, uh, inter I mean, marriage between a man and a man, woman and woman, and so on and so on. So we have better religious people in Nigeria. And even the leadership, anytime there is a problem, they will say religious leaders should pray so that God will solve a problem to us. So until when we start electing God-fearing people, 
people who believe that they are going to be held accountable for their actions in the hereafter. Because most Muslim and Christian believe there is another life after this life. So elect God-fearing people, they will put God in front, and the problem will be over. It appears as if our political system as we have it do not even encourage a situation where God-fearing people can be thrown up to that um, no. position of authority. It's not, it's not that way. You see, election, election, no, election is about people. Mobilize your people. Make sure that people understand your agenda. If you come up with a very good agenda, they will see it and God himself will support you. Mm. What you need is good intention. Mm. Power belongs to God. All of us believe, both Muslim and Christian, that it's not our effort that will make us become whatever we want to become. Mm. So have good intention, good plan for the people, explain to them, and put God in front of you, and God will help you, and you become whatever you want to become. Yes, I'm uh, talking about um, the attacks in Zamfara and uh, the proliferation of arms around um, that region. Now, a lot of people have uh, cited the proliferation of arms to the um, large gold deposits in that region now and uh, they say uh, illegal mining is also linked to proliferation of arm and a lot of these golds are exchanged for arms in the state how when you were a gov when you were a governor at that time uh, this wasn't a very prominent uh, problem but how 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 is the system controlled and how is um, this becoming a serious issue you see, this gold, illegal gold mining is not, uh, it's just a minor uh, problem. It's not an issue. People are just overblowing it. Um, illegal mining in Nigeria has been have taking place uh, even during the colonial masters. But I want to assure you that what is the problem, as I said, is not mining gold. That's the thing that brought the, you know, uh, armed bandit or whatever uh, insurgents you call them. It is just a deliberate attempt by the people, not only Nigerians, people outside Nigeria. You can see people right from Cameroon to Senegal and uh, all these people are coming outside from outside Nigeria, recruiting Nigerians in Nigeria so that they can engage into this armed banditry and insurgency. Some of them are not doing it for economic reason alone. You can see that they are even killing people for nothing without asking for money from them. So I think there is some challenges, security challenges that should be faced by government, by making sure that they have a robot uh, plan and program of action. We have to first of all make sure that we have uh, enough men and women that will fight uh, this insurgency, give them adequate welfare packages, ensure that uh, they are comfortable, give them uh, equipment, guns and uh, communication gadgets, and make sure that you improve intelligent gathering uh, network system and all these things can be over. I, I, I advocated the uh, issue of uh, community policing. Recruit people from every local government and leave them in that local government. Give them enough welfare package, give them uh, communication equipments and weapons, enough to fight these insurgents. It will over from time, to, I mean within short time. If you look at mining is on the exclusive list and that should be um, the responsibility of uh, the federal government. In Zamfara State now, um, we're also hearing that a lot of people are beginning to advocate for uh, the state to be able to uh, should, to be allowed to control its resources. Would that be a likely solution to end all the um, bickering over uh, control of um, gold mines and all of that? No, I don't think it's going to be a solution. What we need, I am an advocate of true federalism, but that does not mean include control of resources. Nigeria as a country should operate like every other country of the world. The federal government should continue to have its powers as envisaged in the constitution. You see, most importantly, we only need to amend our constitution to, to achieve anything we want to achieve. So if we say, okay, states should be given control and powers of their resources, uh, we just don't talk. We get uh, national assembly to start working. The state assemblies, because you need 24 state assemblies, to pass a resolution that will amend our constitution. So for now, we are operating under a federal system. All we need to do is to ensure that the system works. Uh, the states should not be able to control their resources. Whatever is provided in the constitution is enough. And I'm sure the states are faring well. All we need, as I said, is effective leadership at all levels of government. 
Well, if uh, for some of us that have been monitoring um, happenings in the polity lately, political developments, your name has been bandied here and there as somebody who might throw his hat in the ring as uh, the 2020 general election uh, approaches. Maybe I should ask you first here, are you, will you run for the office of president in 2023? Uh, well, having been governor of, eight, of a state for eight years and Senate for another three terms, yeah. that's 12 years, yeah. the next office for me is the highest office of the land. So as far as I'm concerned, as I'm in politics, as like every other Nigerian, my aspiration is to lead the country. And I believe that uh, I have something to offer. That is why I think that uh, by the time I see, because I have developed an application where people who, need to, who think they will support me will register. That's called YSO, Yerima Support Organization. I'm trying to monitor to see how much I can have because uh, we, no, now politics is digitalized. And uh, information age, you know, technology is uh, the thing to go now. And uh, I can see how many people uh, are supporting me as of today. As I'm talking to you now, I have about 2 million, 1.7 million. And uh, I, I, in the next two years, I'm hoping to have 30, 40 million supporters. By that time, I will come and declare. Yes. Yes, and I know uh, you're not just doing this for uh, the sake of it, running for office for just the sake of it. You have something to offer, like you said. What is your offering? Very clear. Like I told you, the Constitution has given us a mandate of president or governors. Security of lives and properties and wealth improvement in the welfare of citizens. What do you do? How do you do it? That's different. You have to bring people of like minds together and see what you want to do in agriculture, in education, in health, social welfare and see programs and projects that will achieve these two objectives, two cardinal objectives. Security of lives and properties of the people and improvement of their welfare. Once you have plan of action, you have objectives that you can drive to achieve these cardinal objectives of the constitution, I think you can achieve it. When your party, the APC, uh, was campaigning in 2015 or event leading up to 2015, they promised so much. The talk was good at that time, the uh, security of lives and property, welfare and all of that. But eventually they got um, to the saddle and Nigerians, as we speak, are not quite impressed with uh, their performance. As a party man, a member of this party, where did the APC miss it? I, I want to tell you that as far as I'm concerned, we have done well. Forget about what's happening today. If the challenges that have been faced today are faced during the last administration, maybe the last administration continued after their first, I mean, the, before that election, I mean, after the election, when the resources level of the government was $140 per barrel, and it had come down to less than $30 per barrel, you would have not been talking like this. The, that time, you can remember, the Boko Haram were almost in Abuja. In fact, they bombed uh, the UN headquarters here, I mean, office. They were in Kanu. But uh, with that least still reduction in economic activities, with the reduction in oil prices, with the COVID-19 going on, you can see the government is still doing a little bit better than what uh, people expected. But I've, I'm sure that uh, Nigerians, many Nigerians are aware that these challenges being faced by government would have, has limited the ability of the government to do what it wanted to do for Nigerians. So I think uh, the president has done well. And uh, all we need to do is to continue to pray so that uh, the economic situation of the world will change. But not everyone agrees the president has indeed done well or his administration has done well. We, for instance, look at um, the issue of um, security. A lot of people are asking for a new strategy. The service chiefs have outlived, some people say have outlived their usefulness. They are even supposed uh, to have retired. People are asking the president to inject a, a new impetus into the whole security architecture. But it appears there is this disconnect. Even members of your party, some members of your party, are beginning to agree with uh, this line of thought, but you still believe the administration has indeed done well. You see, the president is the man in charge. The president is on the seat. He sees what we don't see. If you are elected into an office, 
God will show you exactly what every person may not see. The president knows the performance of these service chiefs more than any other person from outside. The challenges they are facing, you may not know. The strengths and the, the enormity of the challenges. But uh, he has seen it, and they have seen it. And some of us who are from Zamfara, like you said when I was governor, the situation was different. But today I know that the situation is different. And I'm sure the challenges that the government is facing now in terms of poverty level of the country, because of the inadequate resources available to the government, they are faring well. Give somebody who is a very corrupt leader, that's it. You will not be talking now. We would have been like Libya because the crisis would have been more. But I'm sure the, army, the service chiefs are doing their best. They are Nigerians. I'm sure, uh, give me an example. I mean, I give you an example of uh, Borote, the chief army staff. He's from Borno State. He cannot just sit and watch and see his people being killed. And because of worldly things, he will just allow it to continue like that. So the president knows what he's doing. The service chiefs are doing their best. If they are not doing, he should be the one to evaluate and take actions. So it's not talk of people. People can say anything. Like this cause of, uh, I mean, call for uh, devolution of power, call for uh, federal, to rule federalism or whatever it is. The most important thing is people should go and present themselves if they believe they have something to offer to the electorate, let them be elected either to the National Assembly or even State Assembly and see what they can do to present a constitutional amendment so that they can now give their best to the nation rather than talking from outside. You can evaluate. But I think the best thing is that people should participate. Effective participation is the key to our solution, I mean to, the, to our problem. You were once a governor, a two-time governor. Uh, some governors now will tell you that the problem with security is because governors are not in control. They do not control the police. They cannot even uh, control the military. Uh, orders. These people take their orders from Abuja, and they are asking that if they are allowed to do more, if they are allowed to take control, they will then be able to do more. And taking control would mean tinkering with the constitution, devolving powers. Do you think? Uh, that would also be one of um, the solutions that can be preferred to this security challenge we have. I think crying that they are not in control is a sign of failure of that leader. As a governor, I was daily in touch with Mr. President, Chief Olishigo Obasanjo, and he has given us absolute control of our security agencies in our state. There is no way the commissioner of police would not listen to the governor. There is no way the commanding officer of the army or the director SS in a state would not listen to the governor. It is just a sign of saying much. that I'm failing. They have control of the state's security apparatus. The constitution vested power of the security to the federal government, of course, but there is residual, residual control by the states. So the only thing they maybe some of them want to misuse the police and the SS. If they are given security of the, I mean the police, they will use them for their personal uh, problem. You will, you will direct CP to go and arrest somebody illegally, and that may be what they want. Otherwise, I believe that they have adequate power and control of the security agents in their state. They don't have to be given constitutionally to say that the police are now under the state governors. The governors are given adequate control, residual powers by the constitution. Okay, lastly, what's the um, situation with your party in Zanfara. By the way, I think that uh, because of the way things are going, APC Zanfara is an APC state. Even the current governor was in APP, AMP, APP, AMPP, and he's temporarily now in PDP. And I'm assure you that he's going to come back to us. He's already, talk, already talking with us, with the president and everybody. And I'm sure he's on his way to join us. All right. Then. Thank you very much for your time on the program, Senator. Sani Ahmed Yarima. You are welcome. An interesting chat with Senator Ahmed Yarima on the state of the nation and conclusions drawn are that all leaders recognize that Nigeria is a secular country and the two religions are interwoven 
as one part of the country cannot rule without depending on the other. There is also need to tackle the insecurity in the country and bring to book radical religious groups whose actions go against the beliefs of the ordinary citizen who just wants to live in peace with his neighbors. Well, that's our show for today. We'll be back next week to look into another aspect of our national politics. I am Femi Akonu.